Well, welcome everybody. So um, I'm the director of the Center of Math Science and Applications, CMSA of Harvard University. So uh, we have decided since last year that we shall run a annual conference on big data each year. And this year is organized by Richard Freeman, Jun Liu, Ek Tiao, Chris Logan, and Scott Kumas. The last one is the most important one because he has been working every single day on this. And I hope uh, you understand the major person is him, although we have all the big shots around. And the funding is supported by uh, a contribution from uh, Mr. Ng, who doesn't want to be mentioned, but I think we should still mention it. <laughs> and, uh, and also from Sloan Foundation. So I hope Sloan could continue, uh, but it depends on how our performance, I guess. <laughs> but in any case, I think big data is a very interesting subject because it's not as well defined as it's supposed to be. And we hope on the way we can define it more clearly. And uh, so we like to run this conference every year. And um, we are trying to connect mathematicians, uh, statisticians, and you know, people in engineer, economics, and many different fields. It's such a big field that we like to uh, focus uh, each year maybe on some branch of the subject of big data and plus some others. So if you have a good idea, let me know or let God know who would be most efficient. And uh, so um, we would like to have some kind of, uh, each year have some kind of post, uh, annual uh, report or some kind of proceedings for that. So before this, there was, a, there, there, there would be a workshop uh, about uh, two weeks so far. Yeah. So Scott was also in charge of it and he, he was, has been extremely helpful. So we hope to do this uh, annually. And if it goes well, we try to expand it. If it doesn't go well, then this different matter. But I, I'm sure that we will go well with all the smart people, the very intellectual people in Boston area. So uh, now I turn to Scott. This will be a short int introduction. Yiling uh, uh, Chen, she's in, our, in the computer science department, but I believe she's secretly an economist uh, because so many of her papers have strong economics uh, content from, from how, do you do, how do you get people in crowdsourcing to actually follow incentives to some of the game theory things. And then there's a paper you, 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 you if you're interested in, in economics of science issues, which I know some people are, um, in, in the PNAS that d deals with prediction markets, which we thought only economists are really interested in prediction uh, markets. So, Yiling. Thank you very much. So clearly I have been trying very hard to be an economist, but so far I'm still a computer scientist. Um, and this talk you will say that I'm still trying. Uh, so I'm going to talk about machine learning, but thinking about that, the data holders are strategic. Um, so the talk will start with the motivation, and then I will talk about two example projects. So these two projects trying to incorporate two types of strategic behavior. So when data holders are strategic, uh, how can we do machine learning? So let me start with the digital world. So we're blessed with uh, a lot of data nowadays. And because of the data, we think that we can look into the data, we can do data mining or machine learning, we can learn classification rules, uh, we can do regression, and we can find association relationship, and we can discover network relationships. So this is all fantastic. And the data has helped us tremendously to improve what we want to achieve. Um, but if I really think about the data, so they're held or generated by people. And people are often connected with each other uh, through the internet, computers, or other technologies. 
So essentially, when we're thinking about human as the generator or the holders of the data, they're in the loop when thinking about how can we do data analysis on machine learning. So I just want to give you a few examples. So Open Humans is a platform that's trying to uh, encouraging people to share their personal data uh, for scientific researches. So I can go to hup uh, openhumans.org and sign up to participate. And as a participant, I can choose which project I want to participate. So I can select the project and decide my level of involvement. And if I agree to participate in a particular project, I make my data available to that project. So this seems to be a great endeavor for scientific research, because without data, some of the research just couldn't uh, have meaningful results. But if you think about this, different individuals have different levels of willingness to share their data. So the willingness can vary from individual to individual. It's hard for us to really just assume that we will get a representative sample of the data. And moreover, a lot of people who's doing machine learning, they try to get their training data labeled on online labor markets. So there are places like Amazon Mechanical Turk, mainly for micro tasks, so the payment is really low. You can just give them a picture and ask a worker to label the picture, for example. Um, so if I'm giving this picture, and workers might be working on this picture, and I can expect it to get a cat, tiger or animal as a label. Um, what's the potential problem with this platform is that we're paying the workers, but we actually don't have the ground truth answer to the question that we're asking the workers. Or at least it's too costly for us to find out the ground truth and check the workers' contribution. That basically defying the purpose of asking the crowd to help us getting the labels. And if that's the case, one potential issue with this is that we really don't know whether workers are going to exert effort or not. If they're not exerting effort, we may get just random labels, and those labels are not very useful for whatever learning algorithm we're going to use subsequently. Okay. And a more extreme example, we all know that people are strategic and they can misreport. So this is a classical uh, behavior experiment that was done in 2008. So this is a lab experiment. Uh, in the lab, they ask the participants to privately roll a die. And the rule of the experiment is that uh, if the outcome of the die roll is one through five, they're going to pay the corresponding amount in Swiss franc. So meaning that if it's five, um, the participant will get five Swiss franc. But if it's six, the payment is zero. So it means that like a six actually is the worst one in terms of the payment. And in the one-shot experiments, when the experimenter asks the participant to just do this once, um, we got about 6.5% of six, 35% of five as report, and 27% of four. And you can say that the percentage of four and five are higher than what a fire die would get. And if we do this repeatedly, more than half counts as five. So that's the highest payment one. And Rob Miller and his group uh, did a similar experiments on Amazon Mechanical Turk a few years ago. They asked the participants to just uh, report the outcome of a private coin flip. And the outcome is that 70 are heads, 29 are tails, and one is other. And I'm not sure what that other means. Um, so I think this just uh, basically indicates a very simple thing. If we want to estimate the bias of the die or the coin, this probably is not the data set that we want to use. And this becomes so clear that how we collect the data actually matters. So it may introduce bias to our data. It may affect the quality of the data we affected. Oh, it even may affect the validity of the data that we have. And if that is the case, when we're doing machine learning algorithm, we probably should ask ourselves how we get the data. And what I want to promote here is that when we're thinking about data held by strategic people, 
Um, analysis and learning should be considered jointly with incentive alignment, meaning that we should jointly consider how we get the data and what analysis that we can perform to optimize uh, whatever goal we want to achieve with the learning algorithm. So at this point, I hope that at least I convince you how we collect data matters. And in what follows, I want to share with you two projects that we started thinking about how we can incorporate incentive alignment with machine learning. So how we can effectively think about the data collection process together with the machine learning algorithm. And the first one we try to deal with, the first strategic behavior, that is people have different levels of willingness to share. And so this is uh, based on a paper uh, that's co-authored with Jake Abernese, uh, Chin Ju Ho, and Bo Wagner. So when people have different levels of willingness to share their data, uh, there are some prior work that's trying to deal with that. And typically, the strategic model for the agent is that um, there is a cost for the agents to review their data. And we're assuming that the agents cannot fabricate their data, because if they can, that makes the situation much, much more complicated. I'm not saying that that's not interesting. It's very interesting, and there is also a paper trying to address that. But for this setting, just to think about that agent has cost, and they have to be compensated uh, to review their data. And prior work consider some settings of analysis and learning, for example, linear regression and estimated statistics. But so far, the literature hasn't offered any solution for generic machine learning problems. So what we try to do with this paper is that we want to think about a generic machine learning problem. We take what we know in machine learning theory and try to think about what if we try to consider the strategic nature of the problem. Can we get a similar guarantee as what we had in the classical machine learning theory? So, let me start by talking about a classic machine learning problem. So in classic machine learning problem, uh, it is often assumed that there is a data source, and data is drawn IID from that data source. So here, uh, each data point, Z is drawn in IID from the distribution D. And then we have a learning algorithm. So the learning algorithm has access to an IID sample of the training data. So that is the training data set, which is the IID sample of the underlying true distribution. And then we want to output a hypothesis from some hypothesis class, the uppercase H. Okay. And generally the goal is that we want to use a small amount of data, because we don't really want to use a really large training data set and hopefully that we can output some good hypothesis H bar. And what does this good mean? So good in the pack learning model means that we want the generalization error to be small with high probability. And the generalization error refers to when we have this hypothesis H bar, what is the expected error of this hypothesis when it is applied to the unseen data? So the data that the algorithm hasn't seen before, so the future data points. So we really want to train on what we have, but have the algorithm performs well on the future data, drawing from this underlying distribution D. So that is a, cl a classical machine learning problem, and we have really nice theory about it. So for example, I'm just trying to give you a classical machine learning bound. So this is a packed learning bound for generalization error. Um, so for Binary classification, so if I think about we have zero, one labels for the data, then we know that there exists an algorithm that can achieve the following generalization error with high probability. So, um, so let me try to explain what I'm having here. So H bar here is the algorithm's hypothesis. And this L here is the expected loss of this hypothesis on future data. So this is essentially our generalization error on the hypothesis H bar. And so we also can think about we have an optimal hypothesis in the hypothesis class H. And we couldn't hope that we can do better than that. So that's going to be the best that we can do. Uh, but we hope that the error, the difference between these two, 
is small. And this often is captured by a term like this. And what does this mean? So the VC dimension typically measures the difficulty of the problem that we have. So it's really thinking about the either the problem, the better that we can hope our learning algorithm can do. And T is the total number of data points that we train the algorithm on. And this is the limited resources that we have. And this also makes sense because the more training data we have, the better we can hope our learning algorithm to perform. So a bump like this essentially gives us a trade-off between generalization error in terms of the difficulty of the problem and the limited resources that we have. Okay. So that's the classical machine learning bounds. And what we're trying to do is that, let me take the classical machine learning model because that's a really light, nice model. And I want to add incentives to this model. So everything else almost remain the same. So we still have data sources, and that's each data point is drawn from some underlying unknown true distribution D. But now, data hold by people. So each individual hold a piece of data, and each individual also have a cost for reviewing that data. And we allow the cost to be arbitrarily correlated with the data. So that's what makes the problem challenging. So in fact, we can even allow the cost to be adversarially chosen here. And now, when we're trying to do the machine learning, we no longer have the data at hand. We have to think about how can we design a mechanism to procure the data first and then perform the learning. So now I'm turning the algorithm into a mechanism because the mechanism here now contains both the mechanism that I use to elicit the data and also the subsequent learning algorithm that I may need to modify depending on how, like what's method or mechanism I use to get the data. And the objective remains to be, I want to have a hypothesis. I want the algorithm to output a hypothesis that is good, good in the same sense, meaning that it has good generalization error with respect to unseen data that's drawn from the underlying true distribution D. But here, because we have cost, we're introducing a budget. So we want to spend a small budget and output good hypothesis. Okay? So what we hope is that um, after we're introducing incentives here, we can similarly get a generalization error bound just like in the classical machine learning setting, but hopefully that gives the trade-off of my limited resources, which is the budget B, and another measure of the difficulty of the problem. That's what we're hoping to get. And why this is difficult? So just to think about, as a mechanism designer, or a learner, I know that the, max the maximum cost is $100 for any individual. So their cost is lower than $100. So assuming that I actually have this piece of information, then one way I can do is that I'm going to just pay $100 for each data point. I'm just to go and buy the data point, and I'm willing to pay the highest amount to purchase the data point. So this seems to be good in the sense of, after I get the data point, I can just run my machine learning algorithm because I'm still getting an IID sample according to the distribution D. But on the other hand, this doesn't seem to be smart because I spend a lot of money on some data points that may not be useful for me. So if I think about a classification problem, really only the data points close to the decision boundary is useful and all other data points are not so useful to my learning algorithm. So there are relatively few data that are actually useful. And if I care about my budget and how many data points I get, I want to think about a smarter way to purchase the data. And challenge number two. So now suppose I'm not paying the maximum amount. I'm just saying that I pay $10 for each data point. Or you can even imagine that I'm smarter than this. I'm just saying that I'm going to randomly draw a price that's uniformly distributed between 0 and 100, 
and I'm just to pay that random price for, for the individual that I'm encounter next. Okay? I can do that. But what is the problem with this? So just to think about I'm trying to get data to start at HIV, and I'm paying $10 for each data point. And those people who are tested HIV negative, they probably are more willing to share their data with me than those people who are tested HIV negative, uh, positive. So I end up with a lot of negative samples and probably non-positive samples or very few. So clearly I have a biased set of data. So my training data is no longer representative for the underlying true distribution. And so how I set the price to purchase the data introduces bias to the data that I collected. And the subsequent machine learning algorithm needs to address that. Okay. And moreover, when we think about the usefulness of the data to the machine learning algorithm, we're really leaving the mathematical world. We're thinking about gradient and some other mathematical notion that helps the machine learning to more quickly improve. Um, but when we think about the price to pay to get the data, we're living in the economic world. So we're thinking about economic mechanisms, we're thinking about dollar values, prices, and they don't really live in the same world. And how can we assign value to data when we're trying to purchase data from individuals? So, so these are the main challenges that we have to tackle. And I just want to give you a flavor of the main result that we have. So for a large class of machine learning problems, and the large class is described here, essentially um, for what type of hypothesis space. And we require the loss function corresponding to the machine learning algorithm to be convex and Lipschitz continuous. And for budget constraint B, our mechanism can achieve the following generalization error with high probability. And this might look very similar to you right now because this really looks very similar to the classical bound that I have shown you early on. So this is my generalization error for the hypothesis outputted by the algorithm. And H star is again my optimal hypothesis. So this is uh, the expected loss for the optimal hypothesis. And we couldn't expect to, to do better than this. And the better we're doing, the smaller this term is. But now let's say what this term actually represents. So gamma is a measure of problem difficulty, which I will try to explain in the next slide. Um, and B here is the budget. The budget now becomes my limited resources, so I'm getting a generalization error bound in terms of my monetary limited resources and a new notion of the problem difficulty. And let me just uh, uh, talk a little bit about this gamma. So I say that this gamma measures the difficulty of the problem. So gamma approximately equal to the square root of the average cost of the data points that the algorithm has seen, and the difficulty of the problem, which is measured by the gradient for the learning algorithm. Okay? And so what it says is that if our problem is easy, if the average cost is really low, you can think about this, because this term is also bounded by the square root of the average cost or the square root of the, uh, the diffic difficulty of the problem. Okay. So what it says is, is that um, when gamma is small, it can be achieved by one of the following ways. One is that the average cost of the data is very small, which means that my data points are really cheap relative to my budget. And I can purchase a lot of data, so you can expect that I can do well. And the second is that the problem per se is easy, meaning that my learning algorithm can improve efficiently. In that case, I can also do very well. And there is the third case is that if neither of them are small, but the correlation is very favorable for us, then the problem can also be easy. Because the challenge is, is that the value of the data and the cost can be arbitrarily correlated. 
But if the correlation is favorable for the algorithm, then we can also expect to perform well. And certainly when we have a larger budget, we can hope that we can do well. So this is the main result that we get. And let me just tell you a little bit about how does our mechanism work, uh, because we actually need to jump through a few hoops to achieve this. So I'm just going to give you a very, very high level picture about um, how the mechanism works without talking too much about the details. So our uh, mechanism makes use of a class of online learning algorithm called follow the regularized leaders. So in online learning, typically the assumption is that data arriving in an online fashion, meaning one at a time, and the algorithm needs to output a hypothesis at each time step. And the hope is that uh, after t time step, the algorithm's performance is going to be comparable to the best uh, possible hypothesis in the hindsight, meaning that the algorithm is not performing much worse than the best hypothesis in that hypothesis class. And when that is achieved, this is typically called no regret, meaning that the algorithm doesn't regret of picking the wrong hypothesis along the T rounds. Okay? And follow the regularized leader algorithm is a large class of online learning algorithm that is no regret. Okay? So this is well started. And the way we're using that is we're making black box calls to a follow the regularized leader algorithm. Actually, any of them would work. And we use that to help us determine the value of the data to the algorithm and hence, that's going to influence how we set the price to purchase the data. So, so here is our mechanism. So we're thinking about that the agents with the data, they're arriving in an online fashion, or we process them in an online fashion, basically one at a time. And when the T's agent arrives, what the mechanism does is that it makes a black box call to the follow the regularized leader algorithm and say that, hey, tell me, what is the current hypothesis you have? So the algorithm gives the mechanism the current hypothesis HT, and that hypothesis is going to be used to determine the value of different data. Because the value of the data depends on the history of the data the algorithm has already seen. So the mechanism have a randomized pricing scheme and it's going to generate a price menu for all possible data. So essentially, we can imagine that this agent will say a price menu that listed data price as data price pairs, and the agent can decide whether to accept the price for his data or not. And if the agent declines it, he just goes away, and the mechanism doesn't get anything. But if the agent decided to accept the data, then the mechanism gets the data and also knows the cost of the agent, and the mechanism sent the importance weighted data to the algorithm. So here is the importance weighting. Essentially, we're weighting the loss of that data point using the inverse of the probability that we're going to get that data, because we have a randomized pricing here. Uh, this is the step that we debias so that we can still learn well. And this is the step, the, the randomized pricing is, is the place that we're trying to be efficient in terms of using our budget. And this process just continues. So after the algorithm gets a new data point, it can output an updated hypothesis, and then for the next arriving agent, uh, the mechanism updates the price menu, and it continues. And after a big T steps, the, algorithm, the mechanism outputs a final hypothesis. So here, we're just using online to batch conversion in the online learning literature. Essentially, uh, one way to output that is uh, we have all the hypothesis HT from H1 to H uppercase T. We can just take the average of them and output that one. And that hypothesis has the guarantee that I just talked about. Okay. So, 
So that's all I want to talk about for this particular project. Uh, just a quick recap, this project is about we want to run machine learning algorithm. We try to get uh, the generic generalization error bound as in the classical setting. And here, we're thinking about agent. They have a cost for revealing their data. And we need to compensate that cost to get the data for our learning algorithm. And the second setting I want to talk about is more like I'm a machine learning uh, person. And I'm trying to get some training data. And I want to just to send some tasks to some online labor market, like Amazon Mechanical Turk. And here, what I'm concerning is the effort. Do the worker really exert the effort to give me a good quality of the data or not? Um, there's also some related work that's trying to start the setting. And typically, uh, basically, what it, the model of the agent is that oh, the data depends on the effort. So the contribution is effort sensitive. And some of the paper uses a very similar model, which is just replacing effort with privacy. That's privacy sensitive. Um, and people consider estimated statistics or linear regression. So that's the two settings that has been considered. Uh, all of the, this work listed here, they're considering one round payment mechanism. Essentially, they're trying to figure out how can we pay the workers in the current round in able for us to, do, uh, to get good data and for our learning or analysis purposes? And what we're hoping to do, to do here is that can we consider some long-term incentives? Because we're trying to get data from some online labor marketplace. And one natural way to think about it is that workers are there. Uh, they want to continue working in the future. So there's one type of incentives that can be think about that is the future job opportunities. So oh, in other words, can we have some sort of reputation system? So reputation for the workers that we use to select a worker for future jobs. That can be leveraged to provide the right incentive for us to motivate them to exert higher level of effort and serving our learning goal. So that is uh, the setting that we're considering. And let me just uh, go through the specific setting, uh, because uh, the details does matter here. So you can model the problem in many different ways. So here, what I'm considering is that I have one learner who has a set of feature data, x1 through xn, to be labeled. And the learner wants to run a regression. So he's considering a regression problem. And the regression problem uh, has an error term that is zero mean random noise with some variance. Okay? So this is a learning problem that the learner wants to consider. And the learner's goal is that he wants to optimize uh, an objective uh, that treats of the accuracy of the regression learning and the cost of all obtaining the labels, because he doesn't have any label for this feature data. And then we consider a marketplace with own workers. And a worker I can produce a label with noise. And the noise of that label is also zero mean, but the variance depends on the effort level of the worker. So if the worker is, exerts a higher effort level, then the variance of the noise is going to be lower. So this is essentially saying that we're going to get better labels, more accurate labels, when the worker is exerting higher level of effort. Okay? And, and we just assume that the cost of the worker equals to the effort level that it exerts, so without loss of generality. And the worker trying to maximize the expected payoff, which is the payment minus cost. So here is the strategic part comes into play for the worker, because the worker trying to decide the effort level and what we're trying to do is that we're thinking about discretized, uh, discretized time runs. And because we're thinking about the future job opportunity as an incentive for motivating workers to work harder. And the learner maintains a reputation or index for the worker. And at each time t, the learner selects uh, a subset of the workers according to this index. 
And what where so each selected worker is then assigned to a unique data point for, to label. And once the worker generates a label for that data point, he's going to receive a base payment. And what we're hoping to do is that we really want to design these indexes of the reputation for the workers together with the base payment. And we hope the base payment to be really simple because that's going to be more practical when, in terms of like using them in the online marketplace. Okay? And we want to design the indexes and base payment to optimize the learner's objective. That's what we're trying to do here. So, so if you are coming from computer science, um, you probably think about this looks similar to a classical um, machine learning problem in computer science. That is the multi-armed bandit problem. So in the multi-armed bandit problem, so we have a lot of slot, slot machines, which are the arms. And so they may generate uncertain payoff. So we don't know. So there's uncertainty about their payoffs. And it is a sequential decision-making problem that we're trying to figure out uh, which slot that we should pull. And typically, the essence of the uh, solution to this type of problem is that we want to balance exploitation with exploration. Exploration means that like for the arms that we never tried before, we haven't tried so many times before, we want to explore a little more to understand uh, to get a better estimate of its payoff. And the exploitation means that like for those arms that we know already generating good payoff, we want to exploit that so that overall we can get better payoff. So if we're really thinking about the multi armed bandit framework, the similarity to our setting is that if we think about there are good workers and bad workers, so in terms of their underlying quality when they're exerting higher level of effort, then what we're facing is a sequential decision problem that we want to figure out which workers are good workers and we'll assign the task to them. Um, in the multi armed bandit framework, one classical algorithm is called the UCB algorithm. So this is called the upper confidence bound algorithm. So the algorithm is really simple. So it's trying to keep uh, empirical quality for each arm. So when I'm thinking about arm J, it keeps, uh, it's keeping track of the empirical quality of this particular arm. And then the index for this arm is this empirical quality plus a confidence term. Because we haven't pulled this arm a lot of times, then we have lower confidence about the, the, whether the quality really equal to this value. And if I have already pulled these arms for a large number of times, then we have much higher confidence that like, the underlying true level or true quality of the arm is approximately this empirical quality. So if we look at this term, so this NJT is up until to round T, the current round, how many times we have already pulled the arm J. And if this number goes, like increases, certainly this term decreases, and we have higher confidence about that the quality of the arm J is approximately equal to the empirical average of that one. So this is a simple uh, like, uh, algorithm that for each arm, it keeps the index like this, and use this index to decide which arm to pull next. And what we're thinking about is, if we want to run a regression, and we try to get the um, training data label from the crowd, and if workers, they have different qualities, essentially, at a high level, we're facing a marking on bandit problem. Can we have the index rule to be of the UCP style. So essentially, we're thinking about, can we use the UCP style index rule and use that to serve as a reputation for our setting? So it looks very promising, except the two fundamental challenges here. So in the multi armed bandit setting, when we pull an arm, we observe a reward for that arm. Um, so the quality of that arm for that particular round is observable. But here, when we assign a task to a worker, 
because we don't have ground truth, we couldn't verify the quality of the answer provided by the worker, so we actually really don't know how to evaluate the quality of that worker because of the lack of ground truth for quality. And the second is that in the multi-arm bandit setting, when we pull arm, we get a reward that's drawing from the underlying distribution for that arm. But here, when we assign a task to a worker, the worker can strategically decide the effort level to exert to generate the label for that, for that data point. So essentially, the quality is strategically determined. So that makes it to look very different from a multi-armed bandit problem, because we really need to take into consideration of this strategic issue, and there doesn't exist a ground truth. Um, what we show is that we actually can use some UCB style mechanism to achieve this by leveraging some techniques from mechanism design, in particular the peer prediction literature. Um, just to illustrate the idea, let me use a very simple setting for the intuition. So, so now, for simplicity, let's just assume that workers are homogeneous. So we have a homogeneous population of workers. So there's no difference in terms of their quality. So in this setting, um, what makes this easy is that for the learner, there's only one single number that is the optimal effort level that he wants to elicit from each individual worker. So we really can just think about this as, I want to elicit a particular optimal effort level from all the workers. Okay? And let's also just to consider a linear list, a list of square regression. So I'm considering that's the learning problem here. And in this particular case, uh, we can design a mechanism that we call the, uh, the strategic regression UCB for list of square. So the mechanism works in the following way. So we're using an index that's a very similar to the UCB index. So empirical quality of G plus some confidence, like bound term here. Um, but as I mentioned that, we have challenges about how to deal with the empirical quality of a worker G. There's no ground truth, and they're strategically decided. So to deal with the no ground truth part, the way that we can think about is that, oh, let me first just estimate uh, the regression parameters using other agents' data. So I'm not using agent J's data at all. I'm just using other agents' data. And now I get an estimate. And with that estimate, I can use that estimate to evaluate the quality of agent J's data, so in terms of square laws. So essentially, we first get some sort of ground truth or estimated ground truth, and then we use that to evaluate the contribution of a particular worker. And that allows us to actually have an index that captures a meaningful notion of the empirical quality of the contribution of worker G. And after we do that, we maintain this index, and in each round, we select the workers according to this inequality. So what it means? It means that we want to select workers that are close to the best, but we're not going to just select the best. We're allowing an error term here. So this is because of the uncertain nature, and we don't have ground truth, so our estimate may have some error, and we want to create some competitiveness among the workers so that that help us to achieve the incentive property we desire. Because if you only select one worker, and we have no way to verify the contribution of that worker, that worker is going to not exert an effort. So by doing this, we're selecting workers that's among the top set, and they have the incentive to all exert an effort. Okay? And the base payment is that we just pay people uh, the optimal effort level that we want to elicit, plus an error term here. Okay? So, so what we have here is that a very simple fixed payment rule and an index policy that serves as the reputation score for each worker and a simple selection rule essentially saying that we're always selecting uh, the top set of the workers 
to assign tasks in the next round. And what we can get for the least square is that uh, if we're using a mechanism like this, then it is approximate Nash equilibrium, a Bayesian Nash equilibrium, so game theoretic equilibrium, that everyone who's assigned a task are going to exert the optimal effort level that the learner wants to elicit. And this result can be generalized to uh, other settings as well. So it extends to heterogeneous workers. And it also can extend to some nonlinear regression, such as the rate regression. And the nonlinear regression part is actually uh, pretty difficult in the sense of um, all prior work who's trying to design payment mechanism in the one round setting, uh, they can only deal with the lead, um, so essentially they can only deal with the situation uh, when the learning algorithm gives an unbiased estimator. But when we have uh, nonlinear regression, such as the rate regression, the learning algorithm actually retains a biased estimator that made early work, if, even if we're waiting to accept just to have more complicated one round payment, they don't apply to this setting. Um, but the reason that they work here is because we essentially make the incentive to be spreading out to multiple period. So that help us to be able to say something about even if uh, the estimator is not an unbiased estimator, but as long as it converges in a certain way, we can achieve the incentive here. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, I'm having a weaker notion of the incentive solution concept here because I'm having approximate Bayesian and Nash equilibrium here. So this actually requires that everyone playing that strategy is equilibrium. And a better notion would be we have dominant strategy for uh, participants to truthfully elicit their effort. Uh, but we do suspect that with this type of like UCB framework, that's probably hard to achieve. I think that's, uh, that's all I want to say for the second project. Uh, and just a quick recap. So in this particular project, we're considering, um, we want to get labels uh, for our training data from the crowd worker. And we have to deal with the situation that we don't have ground truth. And hence, um, when the contribution of the crowd worker is sensitive to their effort level, uh, we may not get what we want. And the key difficulty is that how can we incentivize the effort exertion from the participants uh, using kind of like a reputation system that we design for this marketplace. Okay. Uh, so let me just conclude here. Uh, don't, don't go away because we have sure. time for so I just want to put this. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to like put this slide again. So I want to say that um, so it's definitely beneficial to jointly considering the incentive alignment with the learning and analysis. Um, and let me just thank my wonderful collaborators. Research, that we're looking for the hardest workers. We're looking for a distribution of the population, some of whom are lazy, aren't paying attention, and to see how humans classify this. I was interested that you had a picture of a tiger, and one of the categories was not predator, because pre I mean, if I see a predator, I don't care what species it is, I want to make sure that I'm prepared to defend myself, whereas if it's a, if it's a kitten, I don't care if it's in the category of cat. Yeah. That's a really great question. So I think, um, so one potential really interesting direction that, um, so I personally think and also my group, like a lot of people in my group also think about is that uh, we actually don't really have very good quantitative model to capture cognitive biases of the individual. 
And that's kind of like part of the reason why this talk focuses on the effort in the way that's typical to economics models. And so when it comes to the cognitive biases and cognitive effort, there's actually work trying to think about how can we design the workflow or the settings such that we reduce the cognitive loads for the workers and trying to make them to work more efficient. Because for example, uh, there's task switching cars, we probably don't want them to switch very frequently. Um, and just to add my point is that I do think this model captures a little bit about what you said of sometimes we don't want to look for uh, like participants who exert the highest effort level. We actually look, uh, want to look for participants who can complete the task like with ease. Uh, those can be modeled uh, by participants are heterogeneous. For so some worker, uh, when they exert uh, just a little bit effort level, is going to be able to increase the quality of the output a lot. For some other workers, even if they like, exert a really high effort level, the improvement is small. And in that case, when we consider uh, heterogeneous workers, we actually will be able to take that into consideration. Does that model depend on knowing the maximum price that the population, the, the, the maximum cost to uh, that a population might have? Or yeah, do you so, learn it? Um, and, well, so the analysis uh, really just to give you the trade off, but if we really think about what that means when we're actually creating the price to use in practice, I would say that like uh, knowing some information about the cost distribution is helpful. So for example, uh, if we know the average cost, that's going to be helpful for us to set the price. Uh, if we don't have that information, we could learn while we're doing the pricing. So essentially, uh, we start by giving the pricing without knowing much, but we gradually get information and we can get more information about the cost distribution and that will help us to price better in the future. Thank you very much.